glorious. We're asking, Lord, that the Bible study tonight will enlighten everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. And you energize us and empower us for everything that lies ahead of us in Jesus' name. Amen. We're asking, Lord, that these studies we're having in the gospel according to St. John will enrich every heart and every life. Amen. And you make us victorious as Christians in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep us awake today. And we pray that whatever will hinder our maximum benefit from your word, take away from our sight in Jesus' name. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. We're coming to John chapter 18. And tonight we're looking at it from verse 12. John chapter 18. Verse 12, I was studying on all through to verse 27. John chapter 18, reading from verse 12. It says, Then the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first. And uh, it says, For he was a father in law to Caiaphas which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which uh, gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient, profitable, and it was necessary uh, that one, one man should die for the people. When I come to verse 25, in verse 25 it says, uh, sorry, verse uh, 19, in verse 19, the high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I speak openly to the world, and I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. I read a part of the, of the passage we are looking at tonight just to make you understand what we are looking at. We are looking at Jesus Christ coming under trial. He had been betrayed by Judas Iscariot. And the people that came to take the Lord Jesus Christ, they arrested him. And they bound him. And they took him to the high priest. Actually, you have the mention of two people. Number one, Annas. Number two, Caiaphas. Actually, Annas had been a high priest before Caiaphas. And for some years now, he had been uh, put aside. And uh, Caiaphas had been uh, appointed. But because the priest of the high priest, uh, the place of the high priest was to be forever until, until he died. That's why he was still referred to as a priest or as an high priest. You come to Luke chapter 3, you have the understanding there. I'm at Luke chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 2. Luke chapter 3 verse 2, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests in the plural. That means Annas was referred to as a priest and Caiaphas referred to also as a priest. And it says the word of God came unto John, that's John the Baptist, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. Come back to John chapter 18. And so Jesus Christ was taken to Annas a high priest and Caiaphas also who was appointed a high priest after him and they were in-laws in-laws and now at the trial of Jesus at the betrayal of Jesus they used the enmity against Christ that is Annas having enmity against Christ and Caiaphas having enmity against Christ they used that to strengthen their bonds that's what you find unbelievers doing sometimes. That even though they might have different opinions about different things. And they might have different directions in which they are walking. But when there is uh, something that is opposed to, uh, to opposed to Christ, they come and they unite him. And when they want to plan any evil against Christ, against Christianity, and against Christians, and they want to achieve their own personal goal, 
Then they get united together. So you'll find Annas and Caiaphas coming together. And then they were rejoicing, celebrating that Jesus Christ now had been arrested and had been bound and delivered into their hands. you find a similar scene in Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23 between Herod and Pilate. You see Herod and Pilate were not really friendly. They were enemies together. And at this time of the betrayal of Jesus Christ, that's, why, that's how they now made use of that betrayal and of the arrest of the Lord Jesus Christ so that they can come together. We're looking at Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 3. It says, And Pilate asked him, saying, I doubt the king of the Jews. And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. Then said Pilate to the chief priest and to the people, I find no fault in this man. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee uh, to this place. When Pilate heard of uh, Galilee, he asked whether the man was uh, a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod. We're talking about Pilate sending the Lord Jesus Christ to Herod. At this time of trial, at this time of betrayal, at this time when they bound him, and it says uh, who himself also was at Jerusalem at this time. Look at this. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was uh, exceeding glad that for he was desirous to see him of a long season. You see, that now made uh, Pilate uh, a good person to uh, Herod. Because Herod, I wanted to see Jesus Christ for a long time. And at this time of betrayal and trial, now Pilate sent him unto Herod. He tells us in the middle of verse 8, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Look at verse 9. Then he questioned what's in many words, but he Christ answered him nothing. And the chief priests and the scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod, with his men of war, set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him to Pilate. Pilate sent him to Herod, and then when he questioned, and Jesus will not answer a word, Herod now sent him back to Pilate. Look at verse 12, underline this in your Bible. And the same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends together. The same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were, they were at enmity between themselves but now the coming of the lord jesus christ to pilate and the betrayal and the arrest and the binding and the enmity they had against the lord jesus christ made them to settle whatever was be be between them using christ uh, to fulfill some selfish desires that has said that's common among people you find that people they want to use christ to settle themselves they want to use christ to have uh, some selfish goals they're using christ for some uh, kind of commercial pursuit you find people they do not love christ and they do not have uh, any association with christ neither are they born again or children of god but it's a kind of commercial pursuit and because of that commerce they bring in uh, the name of jesus christ other people have some selfish goals and because they want to fulfill those selfish goals they use the name of jesus christ they might say they go to church but then their point is here is christ and if we can use christ advantageously for our end that they will do 
fleshly desires they have, selfish goals they have, commercial pursuits they have, and there are some people that have some hidden agenda and some hidden ambition. If this ambition can be helped and lifted up and fulfilled through the Lord Jesus Christ, that is what they will do. That's what happened between Annas and Caiaphas. That's what happened between Herod and Pilate. They had their own hidden agenda, their own ambition. And now Christ was used to fulfill that ambition. There are people that have financial kind of design. They have, they have everything planned out and mapped out. And if we do it this way and this way, we can use the name of Christ and we can have a kind of professional achievement. Or they can have some secular attainment. They couldn't attain that by themselves. But if they can use the name of Christ, if they can use whatever is happening to Christians, they want to use that. Other people, it is for them to have a particular goal and they want to achieve that goal you want to ask yourself are you like Annas are you like Caiaphas and you want to have something and then you bring in the name of Jesus Christ are you like Herod and are you like Pilate that just because you have this opportunity now here is your chance that you can use the name of Christ you can use the service of Christ you can use the worship of Christ not that you are born again not you are, that you are seeking the Lord you just want to use Christ to fulfill your own secular attainment you want to understand that is sinful in fact it's more and sinful it is sacrilegious you're using something secret for something secular you're using something of heaven for something you know on earth and you're using an insincere a kind of a attitude that is not the will of god you're using that selfishly and it's unrighteous it is unfair but though it, uh, through it all, we see Jesus Christ. On the one hand, we see the submission of Jesus Christ. On the other hand, we see the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. Submission, in the sense, when they bound him, he didn't resist. He didn't fight back. When he took him to Annas, was looking at them. When he took him to Caiaphas, he didn't mind at all. And he took him to Pilate and then to Herod. For him, he submitted because this was the will of God. But all the same, on the one hand, you see him is like the lowly lamb. On the other hand, you see him is the mighty lion. Because you can see his sovereignty. And that's those two sides you see for the Lord Jesus Christ. One side, submission. The other side, sovereignty. One side, you can see his meekness gentle and lowly on the other hand you can see his might when those people came and they said we're looking for jesus just looking at them and saying i am he they fell to the ground on the one hand is meekness because he said i am he and if you're looking for me let these ones go the christian must have that attribute of christ on the one hand you are gentle on the other hand you are bold and courageous and if you look at the lord jesus christ can you see number one his calmness his calmness was very cool and calm when they arrested him and when they bound him he went with them like a lamb on the other hand you can see his courage as we go through you'll see that one of those servants they slapped him he looked at him straight in the face and said what have i said wrong if i have said the right thing why are you smiting me if i've said something wrong then show that it is wrong on the one hand you can see his poise that means it was calm cool and collected he wasn't agitated he wasn't embarrassed you see his poise on the other hand you see his power there's always a balance as you look at the life of jesus christ as you look at the comportment of jesus christ on the one hand there's the lowliness on the other hand there's a boldness bold as a lion and yet lamb as a lamb he was lowly you can see his peacefulness and then you can see his perfection we are converted to be like Jesus Christ. We are recreated to become like Jesus Christ. He transforms us. He changes our lives so that we can be like him. Tonight, as we look at this study, the title is Christ, the perfect priest and the lowly lamb. Christ, the perfect priest 
and the lowly lamb. There are three things we're looking at as we look at the passage together. Number one, the previous declaration of sacrilegious carnal Caiaphas. Caiaphas had already predicted. Caiaphas already decided that it is expedient that one man will die for the whole nation so that the whole nation will not go into slavery under the Roman government. And you see this previous uh, declaration being played out. Number one, the previous declaration of sacrilegious carnal Caiaphas. Point number two in this passage, you are going to see the painful denials of a self-confident Christian. A Christian following Christ a Christian, a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, is following after him. In fact, he had promised the Lord, even though I will die with you, I will not deny you. In this passage, you are going to see how painfully he denied the Lord. The painful denials of a self-confident Christian. Point number three, the perfect dignity, the perfect dominion of the submissive, courageous Christ. The perfect dignity of the submissive courageous christ our christ our savior is courageous is bold and is as a lion on the one hand is the lamb of god that taketh away the sin of the world on the other hand is the lion of the tribe of judah meek but mighty peaceful but powerful and I pray that the Lord will reproduce his own character in every one of us in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number one now. The previous declaration of sacrilegious carnal Caiaphas. We're coming to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. And I'm reading from verse 12 all through to verse 14. John chapter 18 verse 12. It says, Then the bunch... And the, and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was a father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest at that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which, had, which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Let's see where he made uh, that declaration and where he said, this is the better thing to do, this is the right thing to do, that one man should die. And so you understand, the trial they were putting in place was uh, unjust and unfair because they decided that the man will die. And it wasn't the reason they were given. It was all something that they just, uh, you know, framed up. We're looking at uh, chapter 11 of John, reading from verse 47. John chapter 11, reading from verse 47. Then gather the chief priests and the Pharisees, a council, a council, and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. That was the real problem. That was the real challenge. That was the thing they wanted to stop. What are we doing? What have we done? What plans can we have? Look at this man. They are referring to Jesus. He doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, if we allow him to go on and on and on, many people are going to believe. It says all men will believe on him. That was their problem. That was the thing they wanted to stop. It, they knew that Jesus was good. They knew that Jesus was mighty. They knew he was powerful. And they knew that Jesus was doing the will of God. They knew he was teaching the word of God. Their problem is that it made them unpopular. Their problem is it made them not to have the preeminence among the people. And it says, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. The Romans will come if this man, he doesn't fight. This man doesn't oppose, uh, you know, what anybody is doing. He just comes here and he preaches the grace of God and the goodness of God and the godliness will to manifest. He preaches that he wants to take people from earth to heaven. He's not concerned about the local things and the secular things and the worldly things and the earthly things. And if he continues like this and people believe on him, the Romans will come. 
they'll take our place they'll take a position they'll take our right and they will take the things we're depending upon not only that they'll take over our nation look at verse 49 and one of them named Caiaphas being the high priest one of them one of the people in that uh, council one of the people in that uh, kind of assembly who is named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, ye, ye know nothing at all. He said, I've been thinking about what we're going to do. You don't know anything at all. You think this man will keep on preaching? You think this man will keep on working miracles? You think this man will continue and then the Romans will come and take our nation? He said, you know nothing at all. Look at this. No consider that it is expedient in verse 50 for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not that was the plan you already hashed it you already told them and so the arrest of jesus wasn't something fair wasn't something just wasn't something that you know the people actually were fighting for righteousness or for any good thing but it was that they wanted to kill him and get rid of him look at the 51 and they speaking not for himself but being the high priest that year that is he had the authority he could you know get all these people together and he could find some uh, fault uh, with jesus christ that they will kind of a uh, cook up and frame up and that's why it say he was uh, the high priest at that time and he prophesied he declared and he proclaimed that jesus should die for that nation and not for that nation only but for also for uh, that he should uh, he should gather together in one the children of god that was scattered abroad then from that day you see that then from that day that they took that decision that they said they were going to kill jesus from that day forth the two counsel together for to put him to death so whatever they were doing they were just acting according to their own carnal nature that's why we play we put at this point number one the previous declaration of sacrilegious carnal Caiaphas. Uh, the word sacrilegious, look at Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, you understand uh, what uh, we're talking about when say somebody is sacrilegious. In uh, Romans uh, chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, we're reading here from uh, verse uh, 21. Romans chapter 12, verse 21. Thou therefore, we teaches another, teaches not thou thyself, Thou that preachest that a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Then in verse 22, thou that says a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, eh, dost thou commit sacrilege? That he said, you know, these high priests and the priests they say, you must not worship idols. They say, we're going by the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And yet these same people were the same people that will do exactly the things that they were telling people not to do. It's like, uh, you know, preachers who say, do as I say, do as I preach. And, you know, I give you the doctrine. Don't look it at my life. Don't look at my family. Don't look at my behavior. Do as I say and don't do as I do sacrilegious now we say that they were also carnal we're coming to Romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8 I'm reading from verse 6 it says in Romans chapter 8 verse 6 for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God Caiaphas at enmity against God against Christ and um, Pilate against uh, God, Herod against God, Annas against God, and these people that came to arrest the Lord Jesus Christ with uh, Judas Iscariot, they were carnal because it says in verse 7, because the carnal mind is against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Look at verse 8, so then uh, 
they that are in the flesh cannot please God. All these uh, people that gather together, and he said, you know, they, they might have said they are fighting for righteousness. They might have said we're doing the right thing. They might have said we're getting him out of the way so that uh, the nation will not call me to slavery under the dominion of uh, this, uh, of the Roman government. But you see, they were carnal, and they were sinful, and they were sacrilegious. So we're coming to Osea chapter 6 and i'm reading from verse 7 osea chapter 6 we're reading from verse 7 it tells us in osea chapter 6 reading from verse 7 but they but they like men have transgressed the covenant they have not they have not they have uh, they dealt treacherously against me. They dealt treacherously against the Lord. Carnal, sacrilegious, sinful, evil, fighting against the Lord. And he said they were arresting Jesus for all these uh, offenses that were framing up. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah chapter 9, reading from verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 9 reading from verse 6 the attitude of these people the character of these people and the, the actions of these people too it says thy inhabitation is in the midst of deceit think of Anna's that's deception and think of Caiaphas all they did that was deception and think of a Herod everything was deception took a look at what Judas and Scarlet did and all those people eventually Judas Scarlet himself came to say I betrayed an innocent blood it says over here that their habitation is in the midst of deceit through deceit they refuse to know me says the Lord and uh, now we're in this case they already decided he must die they already decided whatever evidence we have whatever evidence we don't have he is guilty he must be guilty he must be proved guilty the outcome of that trial already was decided before the arrest the questioning and the interrogation was mere mockery and these uh, these uh, people that came together we must understand there was no fairness in their questioning and there was no justice in their questioning we must say they, are de they were determined to do evil determined to do evil is there anything like that in anybody's character here maybe you're in the position of authority in a position where you can decide on the lives of people you can decide on what happens to them what does not happen to them already although you say we're investigating we're finding out you already made up your mind he must be punished you have made up your mind he must go for this you have already made up your mind we must prove him guilty although the man might have 
be innocent the woman but be innocent you have decided before you even met him that you are going to do something evil to this man that's like you are following the steps in the steps of Annas like you are following in the steps of Caiaphas like you are following the steps of Herod the deed evil look at what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 23 Exodus chapter 23 and here I'm reading from verse 2 Exodus chapter 23 and we're reading from verse 2 it says thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil a council an assembly a congregation some friends some enemies and some people they've come together and have said this is what we will do if you happen to know about it it says thou shalt not follow a multitude to do do evil then it goes on to say neither shall thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment let there be justice let there be the right thing uh, what is the attitude of the lord to the people who are determined to do evil the people who are determined that whatever all the people do whatever whether he's guilty or not we must get rid of him whether he's guilty or not we must find something you know, we can actually get off frame him up frame her up so that he would be denied his right look at some 34 and i'm reading from verse 16. some 34 reading here from verse 16 the face of the lord is against them that do evil the face of the Lord, the might of the Lord, the decision of the Lord, and the throne of God is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. And if such people do not repent, they cannot be with God forever. They cannot live with God. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And as these people came together and they decided before the arrest that Jesus must be charged with uh, whatever a crime they wanted to lay against him. Already that decision had been made and they were guilty of doing evil if you are like that that means you are not a child of god if you are like that it means you are not born again you've made up your mind i must get so and so to trouble i must get such and such to trouble and whatever happens i must say uh, you know find something to round him up look at uh, proverbs chapter 2 verse 13 proverbs chapter 2 Verse 13, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the way of darkness. The people we're studying about today who arrested Jesus, who bound Jesus, who questioned Jesus, who interrogated him, and who said, they found something wrong when there was nothing wrong these were people walking in the ways of darkness look at this in verse 14 who rejoiced to do evil we caught him we bound him we arrested him he will not escape from this one they were rejoicing to do evil and delight in the forwardness of of, of the wicked whose ways are crooked and they forward in their paths i pray will not be like that but you know it's only salvation that can make us uh, have a different life a different uh, heart real salvation that somebody prays through you have repented of your sin uh, and you see that this is the way of evil and with sorrow of heart because of your sin you bend the knee before the lord and say lord i know i've done evil in the past but now i want a new life a new heart a change of life and i want real conversion it is that real conversion that changes you and turns you around and then you will hate to do evil. You just will not want to do evil to helpless people, innocent people, or anybody here on earth. It tells us in Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 8 and verse 9. It says, He that devised to do evil shall be called a mischievous person. He that devised to do evil, he might call himself a Christian, he might call himself a child of God, he might call himself a saint of God, but he's devising to do evil against an innocent person, innocent neighbor, 
innocent relative, innocent uh, relation, and is devising to do evil against an innocent member of a member of the church or member of the body of Christ, he that devises to do evil shall be called a mischievous person. Before you get to the assembly of uh, some people, do you make up your mind? I'm going there. I'm going to create trouble for so and so. I'm going to create a trouble for sister so and so. I'm going to create trouble for brother so and so. I'm going to hinder him. I'm going to hinder her. I'm planning this evil. Please don't call yourself a Christian. Don't call yourself a born again child of God because he that devised to do evil shall be called a mischievous person. It says, look at verse 9 the thought of foolishness even the thought even the thought the thought of foolishness is seen when while you are thinking about it that from the time Caphas were planning this from the time he said it is expedient for us that one man will die and then they were planning that and thinking about that already they were sinners already there was evil they were planning and it says in that verse 9 the thought of foolishness is sin I'm going to put a stumbling block before him so he can fall. Even if you don't have the chance to do it, you have thought about it, you planned it. If you had a chance to get it done, you're not a Christian. You don't have evil thoughts against any brother. You don't have evil thoughts against any sister. Not even a sinner. Not even your neighbor. When you have that thought in your heart, this is exactly what those people did. Annas, Caphas, and the rest of them. The thought of foolishness is sin. And this corner is an abomination unto men. And also an abomination unto God. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. We're looking at verse 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 we're reading from verse 11 it says in verse 11 because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily because uh, you know a stone does not fall from the sky and crush Annas immediately you see if uh, we're not uh, okay in the sight of the Lord what did he knock us what did he kill us what did he destroy us and if that Jesus is mighty if that Jesus is powerful if what we're doing against him is not religiously correct what did he manifest his power and then destroy us look at this because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil because a judgment does not fall immediately because God is not willing that anybody should perish but that all should come to repentance and God waiting for them to come to repentance and they do not know that they think you know that's all right but look at verse 12 do a sinner do evil a hundred times one two three up to ten times they are not satisfied and then they do it 20 25 35 times they are not satisfied they just go on and on and on it's like that's their full-time business anywhere they go because their heart is evil because the mind is evil because their plans are evil and they plan evil against some specific people and though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged yet surely i know that it shall be well of them that fear God and we and we fear before him verse 13 but it shall not be well with the wicked now you say the amen to the other one you don't want to say amen to this it will not be well with the wicked neither shall he prolong his days which are as a shadow because he feareth not before God. It's warning us that we need to understand that God is watching our lives. If we claim to be born again, if we claim to be children of God, then evil will not be in our hearts, will not be in our plans, will not be in our thoughts because the thoughts of doing evil, the thought of foolishness is seen. Micah chapter 7, we're looking at verse 3. Micah chapter 7, we're reading from verse 3. In Micah chapter 7, verse 3, it says that they may do evil with both hands earnestly. You see, these people, they're zealous in doing evil. 
They are passionate in doing evil. They are earnest in doing evil. As the word of God has commanded us that we earnestly contend for the faith, they, the devil, has commanded them and is instigating them to earnestly contend for evil honestly practice evil honestly go the way of the backslider it says in that verse 3 they that they may do evil with which hand both hands honestly it says the prince asketh and the judge asketh for a reward and the great man he uttereth his mischievous desire and they wrap it up they wrap it up you know, they, they understand each other. They understand each other's language. They give the signals to each other. Do it this way. This is the time now. You can strike this time now. You can practice that thing now. And it go, everything goes, they synchronize together. And it says, they wrap it up. The best of them is as a briar. And the most upright is sharper than a thorn edge. The day of thy watchmen and thy visitation cometh now. Now shall it be their perplexity. It's telling us in the New Testament in First Peter chapter 3, verse 12. First Peter chapter 3. And here we're reading from verse uh, we're reading from verse 12. First Peter chapter 3, verse 12. It says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. And now it says, But the face of the Lord is is against them that do evil. They may hide in the church, and they may hide on the title, they may hide on the position, they may hide on the, uh, the proclamation or testimony that we are members of the church, of you know, such a church like this, but it says the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. If you are like that, I pray that genuine repentance will be your Lord in Jesus' name. Our genuine repentance, total transformation, because when you are born again, when you are saved, you will not plan evil anymore, think evil anymore, do evil anymore, and conspire with other people to do evil anymore. We're coming back to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. I'm reading here from verse 12 again. John chapter 18, verse 12. Then the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Anna's first, for he was father in law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest uh, that same year. Now Caiaphas was he, which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Before we leave that point, I want you to realize that these people that sat in judgment against Christ will one day appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And the people who are working against Christians today, and the people who are tormenting Christians today, and they're persecuting, if they're real Christians, they're persecuting real Christians today, these real Christians will judge them on the final day. Don't you know we're going to judge angels? He has done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore, verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord will persuade men. What are we persuading men to do? We persuade men to repent. And if you are here tonight, you have not repented, here is another chance for you. You repent. And as you repent, the Lord will forgive. Not only forgive, he'll set you free. 
it will change your life so that doing evil will become something of the past will not continue your life anymore in jesus name we we'll come to point number two now the painful denials of a self-confident christian the painful denials of a self-confident christian we're coming to john chapter 18 verse 15 John 18, reading from verse 15. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple which was known unto the high priest and spake unto her that kept the door and brought in peter then said the damsel unto that kept the door unto peter i doubt not also one of this man's disciples and he said what did he say tell me out aloud I am not. And then it says in verse 18, And the servants and the officers stood there, who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them, and Peter stood with them, and Peter stood with them, and warmed himself. Let's go to verse 25. In verse 25, and Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said, therefore, unto him, Art thou, art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, What did he say? I am not. not. Second time now, I am not. Look at verse 26. One of the servants of the high priest, being the king of his kinsmen, whose ear Peter cut off, says, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? And Peter then, tell me, denied again, and immediately the cock crew. Here we can see what had happened. The Peter, who was uh, one of the forefront disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, he had actually been warned by the Lord Jesus Christ that the time will come, the temptation will come, the trial will come, and that Peter will deny him. And he said, no, all the other people may deny, but I cannot deny, I will not deny. Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. That's what is called self confidence. It, he was confident in himself and Jesus said, watch and pray. Let's he fall into temptation that the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. He said, don't worry about me. I know I will not deny you. I cannot deny you. Don't you know who I am? If it comes to fighting, we'll fight it out. When the battle actually came, it's not like that because you see, eventually he denied the Lord. These denials of Christ they were predicted but Peter was so self-confident that he said he would not deny the Lord the Lord had warned him and I told him watch and pray because uh, he didn't want him to fall into the temptation but even then uh, Peter still held his ground saying I will not deny you and even though Jesus made a way of escape for him look at chapter 18 chapter 18 uh, I'm reading here from from verse uh, reading from verse 4 Jesus therefore knowing all things and that uh, and shall come upon him went forth and said unto them whom seek ye and they answered him Jesus of Nazareth Jesus says unto them I am he and then he goes on to say and Judas also which betrayed him stood with them and then we come to verse 6 as soon as uh, he had uh, said those words on him they went backward and fell to the ground then uh, asked he them again whom seek he and they said jesus of nazareth jesus answered 
I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, tell me the rest there. Let these go their way. He was talking about the disciples. He said, uh, disciples, you can go your way. They're seeking for me. They're asking for me. And they're taking me away. I surrender myself. I submit myself. If you seek me, let these go their way. If Peter listened to that, if Peter had that, and he went somewhere to be praying, not that I want to go and see what is happening, and then I'll stay with those captains, I'll stay with those people and be warming myself, he shouldn't have been there. And that's what Jesus said, us, uh, said we should pray. He said we should pray that God will deliver us from evil. And God makes a way of escape that we'll be able to escape. But in his own case, he wasn't that careful. I Jesus name. Look at verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. Let him that thinketh he standeth, I know myself, I know I'm born again, and I am a child of God. I can never get near that kind of sin. You're getting near the beach, you're getting near the ditch, don't worry about me. Even if I get very near, you can trust me, I'll never fall inside. The time you see him the following day is falling inside because he's overconfident, because he's self-confident, because he's prayerless, because he's not thinking of his life, and he's not applying the blood of Jesus as your share for him wherefore let him that thinketh his standeth take heed lest he fall. What's the Lord teaching us here? The Lord is teaching us here that deny the Lord is a terrible thing. Deny the Lord is something punishable by the Lord. We're looking at Matthew chapter 10 verse 32 Matthew chapter 10 I'm reading from verse 32. If you deny the Lord in a time of temptation, if you deny the teaching of the word of God, if you deny the calling of God, if you deny your identification, identity with the Lord is such a dangerous sin. It says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, whosoever, whosoever, whether it's Peter or Judas, whether it's, uh, you know, a preacher or a member of the church, whoever, whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my father which is in heaven look at the other side verse 33 but whosoever shall deny me before men whosoever Peter whosoever shall deny me before men Christian whosoever shall deny me before men preacher whosoever shall deny me before men him also will I deny before my father which is in heaven i pray you'll not deny the lord but you must pray you must pray and you must watch and you must uh, watch against uh, that kind of a dinner we're coming to luke chapter 12 luke chapter 12 i'm reading from verse 4 luke chapter 12 verse 4 and i say unto you my friends you see it's not talking to enemies it's not talking to unbelievers it's talking to believers and i say unto you my friends be not afraid of them that kill the body and after that they have no more they can do that's why people deny you know what peter denied well if i say i'm one of them i don't know whether they'll pull me there and say you also you need to come before annas and before Caiaphas and before Pilate and before herod and then look at how young i am if they take me like they're taking jesus and they kill me what will my life become that maybe that's what he thought and he was afraid and jesus said my friends be not afraid of them that kill the body and after that they have no more that they can do but i will for one you whom ye shall fear fear him which after he has killed 
uh, has power to cast into hell, yea, I say unto you, tell me, fear him, and not five sparrows sold for two fardings, and not one of them is forgotten before God, but even the very ears of your head are all numbered. Give me a good amen. amen. Fear not, therefore, fear not, therefore. Remember the word of God. Fear not, therefore, ye of more value than many sparrows, who also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. Verse 9, and he that denies me, and he that denies me, you say you are a child of God, you know the word of God, and you claim to be born again. Maybe your relatives are not born again, or maybe they profess they are born again, but they do not have the same conviction of the Bible that you have. And now you are in their midst, and they, ah, deeper, madam, deeper, you have come. Mr. Deeper, you have come. Now this is what the family is going to do. And don't uh, tell us that. Don't, don't bring Deeper here. We're not bringing Deeper there. We're bringing the Bible there. Do you have your Bible there? Yes. You carry your Bible everywhere. And that Bible will be in your heart. The conviction will be in your heart. And if they say, don't bring that one here, then you say, then I'm not part of you. Then I can go. Because here is where I stand. Anywhere we are, you see what is written there, honestly contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. It's not only on Monday, it's not only when we're in church, everywhere we go, in the office, anywhere, we stand for the word of God, honestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. If we deny that, we make ourselves backsliders. Look at verse 9. But he that denies me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. I pray that will not happen to you. I will not deny the Lord. I said I will not deny the Lord. If you don't say it now, when God can confirm it for you and give you strength outside there, what's going to happen to you? I will not deny the Lord. Now, let's look at this. Now, why do Christians deny the Lord? Peter is gone, and thank God Peter repented because he went out and wept bitterly. And then the Lord restored him, and you can see him in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. Things were different, like things are going to be different with you. And then you can see him when he stood up and preached the word, and 3,000 became converted. Peter became different. I'm going to become different. You can see him when he says, Silver and gold are by none in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk, and that man rose up and walk. Your time has come, and you can remember when they said, By what power have you done this? Did it will tell you not to do this? And Peter said, If you question us as by what power we did this, by that name of Jesus Christ, whom you crucified and God raised from the dead, that man was not uh, you know a coward anymore. I will not be a coward anymore. I said I will not be a coward anymore. You will stand for the word of God in Jesus' name. And they said, okay, now. They threatened them and said, don't speak in this name again. He said, look to that yourself. If it be right in the sight of God, either to obey you or to obey God, but we will do and we will say and we will preach what we have heard from the Lord. They couldn't catch that man again. They will not catch me again. I said they will not catch me again. But let us look at why Christians, what do they deny? And why did Peter at that time, what did he deny? Number one, the fear of man. The fear of man. We're looking at a Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 29, and we're reading from verse 25. Proverbs chapter 29, and I'm reading from verse 25. It says in verse 25, the fear of man bringeth his near. He feared the mage. He feared the man. And the fear of man will also always bring a snare. You know the right thing to do. You know the right place to go. You know the right thing to preach. And you know the way to spend your life. Spending your life for the Lord. And then you fear what they will say. What they will do. What they will think. How they will oppose. How they will, op how they will persecute. And the fire and the pressure that will come upon you. That fear will make you backslide. I pray you are not 
backslide. The fear of man bringeth his near, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord, save he shall be saved. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah chapter 57. I'm reading from verse 11. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 11. And of whom hast thou been afraid or feared? Think about that. What's his name? What's her name? Of whom have you been afraid and feared? And then you say that thou hast lied, Peter. That thou hast lied, Christian. That thou hast lied and hast not remembered me, nor laid it to thine heart. Have not I held uh, my peace and even of as of old and thou fearest me not that time you are fearing man you are not fearing god that man that time you are focusing on man what they will do what they will say how they will react the fear of man makes you to offend god number two following afar the master you are following the master, but you are following from afar. You are not close anymore. You are not close to your Bible anymore. You are not close to the promises of God anymore. You are not close to your conviction anymore. You are not close to everything the Lord has taught you anymore. You are still following. You have not totally gone back. You are following from afar. Following from afar. Uh, let's look at Matthew. Matthew chapter 26. And here we are reading from verse 58. Matthew chapter 26 reading from verse 58 that's the problem when you follow from afar it says but peter followed him afar off but peter followed him afar off you still believe in sanctification afar off you still believe in quiet time afar off you still believe one man one wife but faintly afar off you still believe in the conviction of the bible without holiness no man shall see the lord but afar off and when you are following the lord afar off consecration not like it used to be your connection not like it used to be your intimacy not like it used to be your prayer time not like it used to be you're following from afar off there's danger there's problem number three fellowship with the mockers fellowship with the mockers these were the people that came and they took jesus and they were mocking jesus eventually if you read the whole story it was okay if you are the savior then come down from the cross and peter got in fellowship with them but you know why because he wanted to warm himself it's so cold it's so cold and i need some warmth here and i need some medicine and there's no other place to get the uh, to get the cold removed there's no other place to have the business there's no other place to have uh, the scarcity removed there's no other place where i can have my job there's no other place where i can have this except among the mockers fellowship with the mockers he tells us in john chapter 18 john chapter 18 i'm reading here from verse 25 john chapter 18 reading from verse 25 and simon peter stood and warmed himself and Simon Peter stood and warmed himself among those people. You will not stand with them. You will not stay with them. And look at that word. And Simon Peter, what's the next word there? Look at your Bible, verse 25. And Simon Peter, what's the next word? stood he stood and look at come back to chapter that chapter 18 and we're looking at it uh, from verse i'm looking at it from verse 5 and it says and they answered jesus of nazareth and jesus says unto them i am he look at this and judas also which betrayed him what's the next word there stood with them judas is called stood betrayed the lord jesus christ these same people took the lord jesus christ and they took him away and while jesus christ was being tried was being questioned interrogated they were warming themselves around the fire the same place where judas stood with those people now peter took his place and peter stood there 
when you fellowship with the unbelievers, when you're too close with the unbelievers, when you say, well, what I need, they have. I need to warm myself. I need to take this cold off. Number one, fear of man. Number two, following from afar. Number three, fellowship with the mockers. Number four, forgetting the message. Forgetting the message. The Lord had given him the message. The Lord had warned him. And he has said, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to have you, but I'm praying for you. He had forgotten that message everything you know what we're hearing every monday what we're hearing on sunday what we're hearing all our meeting days if we took all those things to heart and we do not forget we'll have the victory i said we'll have the victory you know, the CPT, when he preacher himself, who is preaching the word, who is opening the Bible, when he falls and he cannot remember, he forgets even the word he has preached. You're a preacher, you're a leader, and you have been preaching the word of God, and then something happens to you now. All those words you have been preaching yourself and emphasizing, you cannot remember. Look at Peter. Everything Jesus said, he had forgotten at that time, forgetting the message. Thank God I will not forget it because you know when we forget we fall we're looking at a luke chapter we're looking at luke chapter 22 luke chapter 22 and i'm reading from verse uh, reading from verse 61 and the lord turned and looked upon peter then peter remembered the word of the lord how he had said unto him before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice he had forgotten he had forgotten it was when jesus Jesus looked back and saw him. He recollected, oh yes, that's what he said. And look at it now. It has happened already. It's falling already. Forgetting the message. Number five, fainting in the mind. Fainting in the mind. They took Jesus. I thought he'll, he'll escape. I draw the sword and cut up that ear. He picked back the ear and put it back there again. And now they've taken him. Look at him following them. And he cannot dismiss them and send them away and manifest the power. This is the man that walked on the sea. This is the man that said storm and stop and he stopped. What has happened to Jesus? Because of that, he fainted in his mind. But you know, Jesus Christ was not fainting in his mind. You will not faint in your mind. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm reading here from verse 3. Hebrews chapter 12, we're reading from verse 3. It says in verse 3, for consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. When you faint in your mind, you give up. When you faint in your mind, it's like, you know, if that is happening to Christ, if that is happening to Peter, if that is happening to so and so, who am I? How can I stand? Well, thank God I can stand. And thank God I will stand. Even if you have to stand alone, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you'll not faint in your mind. You'll say, Nebuchadnezzar, go ahead and do what you want to do. Our God whom we serve, he'll deliver us from your fairy furnace. He'll deliver you in Jesus' name. Even if there's nobody, you are the Daniel, and they say the lion's den is there. If you pray, if you carry out conviction, if you stand for what you say you believe, look at the lion's den open there. We're going to throw you in there. You will stand. I said you will stand. Okay, I can say it for myself. I will stand. I said I will stand. The Lord who has helped me for, don't you know when I was converted? 1964, long, long ago. And day after day, week after week, and month after month, and year after year. And here I am today. I still believe the same thing I believed many, many years ago. And you, if you can see that, that God held this man, God will hold that man there. He'll hold that woman there. You will stand in Jesus' name. There's no fainting. I said there's no fainting. Number six is faithlessness at the critical 
moment. The moment came. You see, there are people that have faith before the problems come, before the mountains come, before the challenges come. They have faith and they say, I will move every mountain. I'll tell those demons, get out. And all those people, they want to persecute me. I'll tell them, no way. I'm going to stand. That before the moment arises. Now, when the moment comes, all that they have been saying, consecration and everything, I lay everything on the altar. I surrender all. Everything I is vanished into the air because that faithlessness at the critical moment you will not fail Amen. your faith will not go down Amen. look at this we're reading from hebrews chapter 10 hebrews chapter 10 i'm reading from verse 38 now the jaw shall live by faith but if any man draw back thank god that's not me my soul shall have no pleasure in him, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Those who draw back, what do they draw back to? Unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Number seven, number one. Number one is the fear of man. The fear of man. That's what hinders people. Number two is uh, fellow following afar, the master. Number three is fellowship with the mockers. Number four, forgetting the message. Number five, fainting in the mind. Number six, faithlessness at a critical moment. Number seven, falsehood before the multitude. Falsehood before the multitude you see peter saw the multitude and he saw the crowd there and he saw the people that were saying crucify him crucify him can i stand look at this a mob and look at this mixed multitude and look at what they are saying he began to shake and then he became false before the multitude in a proverbs chapter 14 i'm reading from verse 5 proverbs chapter 14 we're looking at uh, verse 5. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 5, it says, A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. I am not, I don't know him, I'm not his disciple. That's a lie, Peter. And it says, A false witness shall utter lies. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 5. A false witness shall not be unpunished. And he that speaketh lies shall not escape. Look at verse 9 of that same chapter 19. A false witness shall not be unpunished. That means he'll be punished. And he that speaketh lies shall, shall perish. I pray you'll not perish. Lying must get out of your life by all means white lie black lie small lie big lie a lie to protect yourself a lie to get out of trouble because you're afraid of them that's why you're telling them lies that's why you think if i say the correct thing if i say the right thing i lose my face i lose my you know respect and already what was that respect about tell the truth and put the devil to shame give me a good good amen uh, look at what the Lord is telling us in uh, Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, uh, and I'm reading here from verse 8. Revelation chapter 21, we're looking at verse 8. It says, But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars. How many liars? The small ones and the big ones, the ones that play with lies. The ones that say, oh, I was only joking. You joke with lie. You joke with deception. You joke with falsehood. You don't remember your Bible. You don't remember the word of God. And all last shall have their part in the lake are burned with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Look at verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever walketh abomination, nor maketh a lie, or maketh a lie, but they which are rich in the land book of life we're coming to revelation chapter 22 reading from verse 12 and behold i come quickly and my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be i am alpha and omega 
the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments. That they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the allmongers and the murderers and the idolaters and tell me whosoever loves it just becomes a habit a habit even when there's no reason to tell a lie he forgets himself she forgets herself whosoever loves and makes a lie it says they will all get into hellfire thank god i'm not going there we're coming to point number three now the perfect dignity of the submissive courageous christ we're coming to uh, john chapter 18 in john chapter 18 i'm reading from verse 19 john chapter 18 we're reading from verse 19 and the high priest then asked jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine what do you need the names of disciples for what do you what do you want to do with that already you have decided you are going to condemn christ already you have decided he's guilty what will his disciples do to you and then of his doctrine they were not really interested in the doctrine they were just wanting to get something you know, to nail him look at verse uh, look at verse 20 and jesus answered him i speak openly to the world i spoke openly to everyone because i was sent to the world i wasn't sent to be in a corner somewhere and a locality somewhere to be preaching the word i was sent to the world to preach the word and i speak openly to the to the world i ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple whither the Jews always resort and uh, in uh, secret have I said nothing why askest thou me ask them, uh, ask them which heard me that I what I have said and then he says and they will uh, behold they will they know what I said and when he had thus spoken, one of the officers, look at this, such boldness, such effrontery. And he says, one of the officers, which stood by, struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? And Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil, calm and cool, poised collected. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't shaking for them. That's just a creature. Christ is the creator. That's just a man. Christ is Lord. Even though he's motim, and uh, you know Jesus knew that that was not wrong and then he said, why are you smiting me if I've spoken evil? Witness to that evil, but if well, why smitest thou me? I pray God will give us courage. They'll give us boldness so that you'll not be afraid when those persecutors when they even do what they shouldn't have done and maybe it's your child you're trying to correct your child and your child has the effrontery to do something either to raise his hand don't run away for the child stand there and said you want to do the unthinkable go ahead and do it Go ahead and do it. We must be cool and courageous, calm and courageous. We shouldn't allow somebody that is not up to you know, should not do something against the King of Kings, against the Lord of Lords, and then he wants to do something he shouldn't do, and then we're running away. You will not run. You are a child of the king. And because you are a child of the king, the one in you is greater than the one in them in Jesus' name. But you know, Jesus Christ is the perfect one. He has perfect dignity and submission and courage. As you look at Jesus Christ, just and holy he was, and yet he was treated as unjust, as unholy. He was sinless, and he was guiltless, and yet he was treated as if he was sinful, as if he was guilty. Great and glorious was the Lord Jesus Christ. He was treated with ignominy and with humiliation for all of us, for you, as your substitute. But thank God for our Savior. 
Thank God for my own Savior. Thank God for Jesus Christ. Perfect, pure, and powerful. It's still there. You can see the perfection of Christ there. You can see from the words coming out, you have not convinced me of sin. There's no sin in my life. Why did you smite me? I'm here, and they're questioning me. They have not even found me guilty. And then you smite, you smote me. He was perfect. He was pure. He was powerful. Not only that, he was godly. He was good. He was glorious. The majesty. As you look at him there, even though he was under trial, you could see that goodness and that godliness and that glory coming out. He was sinless. He was spotless. And he was stainless. You couldn't accuse him of sin. You couldn't accuse accuse him of getting angry. Was he angry? I said, was he angry? He looked, and yes, was he afraid? No. You see, there are people, they think, if I'm not angry, then I must be afraid. Because if I'm not afraid, if I'm not, uh, you know, kind of weak, they might uh, smite me again. Nothing will happen that God has not ordained. Whatever happens, God has ordained it. And God has predicted it. He has prophesied it. All things work together for good to them who are the called of God. Whatever will happen is what God has ordained. And he says, my grace is sufficient for you. Amen. Give me a good, good amen. amen. He remains holy and honored and heavenly. The majesty there and the courage there. He was blameless. He was faultless and he was flawless. He was meek. He was merciful. He was mighty. You can see when he came to the garden and he cut off the ear of that servant, even though they came to arrest him, he didn't say, well, then said, Peter, put that back. And then he bent down, took up the ear. Majestic action. I pray God will give us his glory. He'll give us his grace to behave like that in Jesus' name meek, merciful, and mighty. He was faithful for giving and for bearing, and he was a perfect savior, and this he did for you. He, through it all, he did not commit sin, and through it all, whatever is happening to you, you will not commit sin in Jesus' name. We're coming to John chapter 8, John chapter 8, and I'm reading here from verse 46. John chapter 8, verse 46, which of you convinceth me of sin? You could tell them that boldly and courageously because there was no sin in his life. There will be no sin in your life. First Peter chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 20. First Peter chapter 2, and here we're reading from verse 20. In verse 20, for what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently, but if when ye do well, when you live righteously, when you when you have not committed sin, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. For here unto what ye called, because Jesus, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow His steps. You will follow the steps of Christ. Amen. Calm but courageous lowly but bold it says who did no sin thank god he committed no sin neither was guile found in his mouth who when he was reviled he reviled not again and when he suffered he threatened not but he committed himself to him that judges righteously. That's what the Lord expects us to do when something similar like this happens. When they accuse you unjustly, you're not beginning to cry and begin to shout and begin to swear. If, uh, you know, somebody telling a lie against me like that, this will happen to him. If I ever did nothing, let this happen to me. No, you're not doing like that. You follow the example of Jesus Christ. Give me a good, good amen. Amen. First Peter chapter 1 verse 18. First Peter chapter 1 verse 18. For as much as she know that she were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb, tell me, without blemish and without spot. 
that's the lord jesus christ we're looking at uh, hebrews chapter 4 hebrews chapter 4 we're reading from verse 14 uh, hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 seeing then uh, that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast the profession a profession for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are tell me yet without sin say that aloud yet without sin say that once again yet without sin let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need like he was righteous he'll keep you righteous he'll keep you stable keep you solid in jesus name look at chapter 7 hebrews chapter 7 reading from verse 24 hebrews chapter 7 verse 24 but this man referring to jesus because he continues ever has an unchangeable priesthood wherefore is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto god by him seeing he ever live to make intercession for them look at his character here for such an high priest became us who is holy amen, amen. harmless amen. amen undefiled amen. amen separate from sinners amen, amen and higher than the heavens finally amen. amen first john chapter three jesus the perfect one jesus the righteous one jesus the holy one sinless spotless and stainless flawless and he was faultless and he was blameless first john chapter three reading from verse five and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. That's why he suffered. Look at the latter part of that verse 5. And in him is no sin. Can you say that with me? Can you say that aloud? And in him is no sin. It says whoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. When we come to Christ, he gives us grace and the smallest of sins we will not commit. You will not commit. Lying, you will not commit. Evil, you will not do righteousness will be in my life righteousness will be in my life but say he that committed sin is of the devil for this devil sinner from the beginning for this purpose the son of god was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil whosoever is born of god who is born of god whosoever whosoever when you come to christ he makes you to be born of god and then he will live inside you you'll be bold you'll be courageous you'll be godly you'll be righteous and holy in jesus name whosoever is born of god does not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin and he cannot sin who is that and he cannot sin i said who is that that's you, that's me, that's us, because he's born of God. Because we are born of God, he gives us his grace and we remain holy and righteous. When temptation comes, we stand like Jesus stood, firm, fearless, faithful, and we're going to overcome. Yeah. Chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 18. It says, we know that whosoever is born of God, sinneth not but he that is begotten of god keepeth himself and that wicked one touches him not who is the one that the wicked one will not touch greater is he that is in you than, than he that is in the world you'll be victorious in jesus name let's rise up now and take everything we have learned to the lord in prayer let's tell the lord is that he has perfect dignity and perfect dominion even though he submitted to those that arrested him it was bold and courageous bold and courageous and that same boldness as same courage the lord will give unto you 
he has suffered for you he bore your punishment he bore your shame he bore your if we bore everything you've done now you call upon him and whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved and you will not deny the lord you'll not have any fear of man you're afraid of them you're afraid of them and you'll not be following from afar you'll not be fellowshipping with the mockers you stand apart separate yourself away from them and stand firm and stand true so that by the grace of god that grace flows into your life and you stand and you stand faithful and firm and courageous and nothing is making you afraid you're not faint in your mind you'll not forget the message you are hearing you'll be faithful at the critical moment and there'll be no falsehood and no lying in your life no lying for any reason whatever because you are not afraid of anything of anybody you're standing for righteousness and you stand firm all the days of your life the lord grant you the grace to be who you ought to be as a real christian